Dr. Gats Power. It is a pleasure to welcome you on Autoroute Expressway. I am not alone. Good afternoon. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Thank you, Benny. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm very fine. I like to say good afternoon to all the members of the studio. I know uh, you are extremely busy, and when we tried uh, while you were in Nigeria, we had trouble back and forth. We spent about half hour trying to get you back on the air. I was so pleased when I knew you were coming for this conference this week, and I said, oh, man, that was the best time, and I appreciate the fact that uh, you take the time and you will share with the listeners some of your experience as a, a doctor from Nigeria and you know our audience is mostly uh, Creole-speaking Haitians that are listening, but we're all from Africa. That's what they usually say. That's our history. So if we could relate, and I would say you work a lot with many Haitians. You are the chairman for the Haiti Cholera Funding Foundation. We know how much Ravage Cholera is doing right now in Haiti still. But uh, let's start by reaffirming everyone, where are we right now with the outbreak of the Ebola virus? Right. We, the Ebola virus, it's, um, as we all know, it's one of the viral hemorrhagic um, diseases you know, that um, the recent outbreak of it started first in uh, Guinea and uh, with a two-year-old child who probably physicians could not really relate early enough with the disease to know it was Ebola. So it was reported lately as Ebola. By that time, a lot of persons have already had contact with the child and then uh, started spreading thereafter. And um, that was in late December 2013. And that kept on going with the disease spreading from Guinea to neighboring Liberia and um, Sierra Leone. And uh, so far, we've uh, recorded about 7,300 and deaths. Yes, about 7,300 deaths as of yesterday. Now the statistics we have on the deaths from Ebola. And um, it's quite alarming that you would have such very gory statistics from um, a disease of this nature. But if you understand the pathogenesis of this disease, by pathogenesis I mean the very way the virus causes harm to the human body, you will understand why you have so many casualties from the disease. Now, the disease got to my country, Nigeria, somewhere around uh, July, and uh, the first confirmed, laboratory confirmed case of Ebola was uh, reported on the 23rd of July. And uh, it was brought in by a man named Patrick Soria, who came in from Liberia to Nigeria purportedly to come seek um, better uh, medical care. And uh, on arrival uh, in Nigeria, Thankfully, the Nigerian Medical Association at that time, you know, was um, on the showdown with the government, you know, for want of better working conditions for its members. And so that really made, um, that, I would say, contributed largely to the containment efforts of Ebola in Nigeria. Because were the doctors to be working, Ebola would have spread you know, further than did, you know, you know that that it, that, that it did. So now, the people, the people in Nigeria w- were very fortunate. Uh, yeah. Is it the help of, of the government and also the the doctors that work diligently? Yeah, the people of Nigeria were fortunate that the the disease arrived in Nigeria at a time when doctors were on strike. Yeah, they were on they were on industrial action. You know, you know, protesting, you know, an improvement 
you know, in their in their in their working conditions. So that I would say is a ground, is a foundation of the success that was recorded in Nigeria, you know, over Ebola. You know. But that being said, there were a host of other things that came together, you know, to contribute to the success Nigeria records to be, you know, over Ebola. And uh, one of it is that while the disease was ravaging the neighboring countries uh, earlier mentioned, there was already, you know, a mechanism put in place in Nigeria to create awareness about the disease. So thanks to Facebook and Twitter and all other social media outlets, you know, they were deeply engaged, you know, towards giving information to the public about Ebola. And so people were already aware that there was a disease called Ebola even before the disease got to Nigeria. So the population, so, the population took a lot of precautions? A lot. A lot of people knew about it already before it came. So pretty so much the that, awareness, that's what helped it a lot as well? The, the awareness, I would say, is the first thing. After you know, the fact that doctors were not working. Now, I keep referring to doctors not working as a main contribution to our efforts in fighting Ebola because you will not understand what I'm saying. What that simply means is that were doctors to be working by the time Patrick Soya arrived in Nigeria, what would have happened would have been that he would have been taken right from the, the airport where he was noticed to have symptoms. He would have been taken from there to the first major hospital there in Lagos. Where he, where he, where he, where he arrived. So many more would people been, would have been exposed. He would have been taken to the hospital, and you know there are protocols in patient admission, and so the protocols he would have gone through in the process of being attended to by a physician would have exposed a lot of other persons, you know, to the to the disease, and contact tracing would have been hectic, because with lots of people exposed to the disease, tracing the contacts would be a problem. In fact, that is even the problem right now as we speak in Liberia and particularly in Sierra Leone where the disease seems to have taken a major foothold. Now, a total of 20 people were affected in Nigeria. A total of 20 people. Of the 20 people who were affected, we had eight mortalities. Eight mortalities, eight died out of the 20, with 12 survivors. Now, the story of Ebola in Nigeria is particularly fascinating because when you call to mind that the global projection of the fatality from Ebola ranges around 70 to 80 percent, you find out that in Nigeria the case is completely different. We had a mortality, uh, we had a case fatality percentage of about 40, you know, and um, for the survivors, the stories we got was that they mainly were fed with just oral, re oral rehydration solutions, just ORS. That was basically the therapy that was instituted in those patients' management. But that cannot be said of countries like Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, where we have similar conditions, but similar therapy is not used. In, so, do you have better and do you have better infrastructure in Nigeria as far as the hospitals and the whole setting? Well, than these are than the other country in West Africa, like Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia that are have the most well, infected. Well, as you know, today Nigeria is um, the most populous uh, nation in Africa and uh, the most thriving economy as well. Well, as for healthcare infrastructure, I would say, yes, we have a better healthcare infrastructure when you compare our country with countries like Guinea, Liberia, and uh, Sierra Leone. But you, you can say so for South Africa. I would say that um, marginally, the South African healthcare infrastructure is a lot better than ours, marginally. Okay, um, now we understand clearly uh, Nigeria got saved by the bell, I would say. 
you are planning to go and volunteer because you're going to go to the training at the CDC to help with the Ebola patient in West Africa. Where will you go exactly? Was it going to be Liberia or Sierra Leone, or you're not sure where you're going after the training? Yeah, the fact is, um, as we speak, there is uh, local efforts by my government to coordinate the sending of volunteers to Ebola-affected countries. And um, just before my coming to the United States, a contingent of uh, health workers were sent by my government. And so we uh, we have a platform on ground that allows volunteers to put their names down, put their contacts down and stuff like that. Aren't you a bit scared? I mean, uh, when we seeing with the statistic, uh, more than half of the percentage of the healthcare workers are getting infected. So we would say easily, although they take precautions. And even here in the U.S., we had several. And because of the protocol and the infrastructure that they have in the U.S. with the best hospital, unfortunately, Mr. Duncan had died. He was not a healthcare worker. But uh, aren't you a bit concerned and scared the, of contracting the Ebola virus by going to one of those neighboring countries? Well, to say I'm scared is out of the question because uh, my job as a medical doctor is to confront diseases with the best of therapies available and um, get results. Um, if the medical doctor is scared of diseases, then who should treat the patients? So that's why you are called heroes. Yeah, so we do that. That's what we do. That's what we're trained to do. That's good. Um, we're going to leave Ebola for a minute. I know the one that's very passionate to your heart is helping those <laughs> victims of uh, the Boko Haram who continuously, just recently, they have gotten a couple hundreds more and they have burned villages, and you had the opportunity in Nigeria to treat some of these victims. What does it feel like? And as a doctor, is it just all you're able to do, just treat? Have you been involved with your government? Uh, Have you been aware? Is there a lot more being done with those um, extremists? Those guys are brutal. The Boko Haram. It seems like they rule as well in Nigeria. Yeah, well, um, firstly, talking about whether I have uh, any relations with my government relating to Boko Haram, we don't have such a um, uh, platform for negotiating with our government on Boko Haram. I'm a medical doctor, I'm, I'm strictly professional, and uh, wherever my profession is, uh, my professional expertise is required, I, I go there. Now, I'm talking about um, my experience with Ebola, with the Boko Haram patients, well, victim, I would say I left medical school sometime last year and um, I had my training in the University of Benin. Uh, University of Benin is many, 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 many hours drive from uh, northeast Nigeria where we have the um, problem of Boko Haram. And so not many doctors who had trainings like me would want to go, you know, on such trip to go work in such place. But like you said earlier, some of us are heroes, others are not. And so we go to hospitals where there are problems to go work. And so that's how I saw myself. And uh, on arriving at that place, I found out that the statistics of doctors to patients is uh, abysmally low. We had no doctors, there were lots of patients, apart from just the casualties and victims of the Boko Haram problem. There are a host of other diseases that are endemic to people of the northeast Nigeria that uh, for which they call uh, the need uh, urgent uh, interventions. And uh, my coming to the U.S., you know, it's not just uh, only for Ebola or uh, have other reasons why I came to the U.S. You know, as a chairman uh, and director for Nigeria on the platform of Haiti Cholera Research Fund Foundation, we are making plans to see how we could um, also address other problems that are endemic to the northeast Nigeria. Maybe we'll talk about that later. But for now, let's uh, look at the Boko Haram victims. Like you said, 
they are merciless. But recently, there seems to be, you know, a change in approach to their operations. Unfortunately, you're out of time, Dr. Gatspower. I got to bring you back again. I know you're doing a lot more work, um, especially also with the Haiti Funding Foundation for the Cholera Research and your government as well, and more patients that you are helping globally. Uh, I will invite you again because the work will continue. And um, what is more rewarding for you when you are helping those victims of Boko Haram? Thank you. What is more rewarding for you well, as a doctor? For me, for me what is rewarding is the um, same people who, by, by reason of... Um, violence have been you know, destined to die, come back to life. That's what's what's what gives me joy. Because a number of times we see patients come from, you know, places and they come with um, yeah, the injuries. Uh they beg for life really. So by the time we are through with them, some of them, you know, get out of their problems, out of their misery and go back happy. For that I am I'm most rewarded. I'm very happy seeing patients. That's why it's a pleasure having you um, on Autoroute Expressway as a guest for the wonderful work that you are doing. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation.